Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on robotic automation for accounts payable. We're delighted to be joined today by Alan Brown who is a sales consultant in finance automation and business process management at ITSoft. Before I hand you over to Alan, there are a few points I would like to make. To minimize disruption, you have all been automatically muted. If you have any questions, please write them in the questions box as there will be a short Q&A session at the end. You will all also be uh, sent a copy of the slides and the recording after this session. So without further ado, I am going to uh, hand you over to Alan. Thanks, Alan. Quite all right. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this webinar and uh, thank you for attending. You should all be able to see in front of you the title slide that we have up uh, for robotic automation for accounts payable. <clears throat> Just to really help out during this session uh, and to get some feedback from yourselves. What I'd really appreciate is on the right hand side of your screen uh, there is a chat log. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as you've got questions please put uh, the questions in through the chat log. Uh, we will then answer the questions uh, at the end of the session. Uh, so that there's a, a flow and continuity to the webinar that we're going to go through. But it usually makes sense for most organisations to be able to uh, put the questions in as the person has them, uh, even although they may be slightly out of context when we get to them at the end. Now, during this presentation, what we're or, or this webinar, what we're going to be looking at is things like uh, uh, impact of new technologies, how does that apply to digital transformation and more specifically to the accounts payable uh, uh, teams and area? So you should be able to see in front of you now the agenda that we're going to go through uh, for approximately the next hour. First thing that I'm going to take you through is just to put some context in place about who ITSoft are and therefore give you some uh, information about uh, ourselves as an organization. Then I'm going to look at uh, what are some of the uh, priorities within digital transformation, specifically within the finance departments for organizations. And this is uh, feedback from CFOs more than anything else. Once we've covered that, and that's really to you know, put some scope in place about what some of the problem areas are and, and how organizations are looking to the future, is we're then going to look at some of these disruptive technologies in a bit more detail and try and uh, apply a level of simplicity to this and understanding in where do they sit in terms of capability and maturity, as well as the different uses that they can have within the financial departments. So areas like uh, the cloud, for instance, or robotics, and there are various different uh, terms that are used for robotics. We're also going to look at uh, artificial intelligence, uh, some of the advanced analytics uh, and reporting capabilities that come out, and probably by far and away the one that's had the most buzz in the marketplace uh, in the last, certainly six months, is blockchain. So we're going to look at these types of technologies and you know what are the limits with these, you know, what capability does that bring and how does that all apply to AP? Then we're going to go into, as part of that, talking about invoices, supplier invoices. How do they get processed? How do these disruptive technologies apply to uh, the processing of invoices in much more detail? Uh, then we're going to look at our next generation product streamlined for invoices. Uh, in a lot more detail uh, and how is that a disruptive technology in its own right. I've put questions at the end and answers specifically. Please ask the questions through the chat log and I'll put reminders during the session in as well as we go through. But please put the questions in and assuming we've got time at the end, we will answer questions as part of the webinar. If we don't get around to all of them, then we will come back to you individually with answers as uh, at, at the end of the session, uh, just to follow up and, and make sure you've got all the information that you would like. So, without further ado, um, we're going to uh, start off with uh, a little bit of content about who we are. 
And really, the first thing I just want to put in place is a little bit of context. Our whole business as a company, ITsoft, is all about the digitalization uh, of invoices. Now, it's all about uh, document processes we've got up here, but you know, for, for the context of today, this is all about uh, invoices and how do we digitalize them, so that's how do we capture them, and how do we move them through an organization as part of that capability. Now, we're a French-owned, French-based organization that specializes in this area. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We are specifically looking at dealing with the complex processes that require a huge number of interactions around these documents uh, that come in in different formats, different structures, uh, etc. And some of these uh, processes deal with uh, uh, outside of the invoices, things like membership management or e-contracting uh, or insurance claims, you know, things like that. But we're also talking about internal processes like HR processes, quality processes, uh, health and safety processes as well as the supplier invoicing uh, aspects that we're going to be focusing on in this session. So some of the key things that we want to be able to just highlight out to yourselves today uh, and why we are so good in this area is because we were founded in 1984. So the company as an organization has been around in excess of 30 years, specifically focused in the document processing area, specifically within the financial documents invoice processing aspects to that turning over you know in excess of uh, uh, almost 26 million euros uh, in 2016 and we have cash in the bank that we are using to put back into uh, r d but more importantly from your point of view there are in excess of 650 clients uh, that are currently using the software in a number of different guises, covering uh, in excess of 36 different countries. In Europe uh, alone, we cover 80% of the marketplace directly. Um, in other areas like South America or the Far East, we have lots of resellers that uh, take our market to product uh, in these areas. But the key thing is we are very focused, as you can see on the right-hand side of the page, where we've got some uh, client names up here, PepsiCo, Network Rail, Autoglass and others, um, on the departmental focus that uh, supplier invoice processing needs to have. So this is not about uh, a, a specific vertical market. This is not about uh, a specific uh, uh, product type. This is about what happens within invoice processing in the vast majority of organizations uh, that have a similar type of problem, irrespective of the type of ERP that they have. Now, as you see, you'll see up there, some of these companies are multinational or uh, uh, large-scale international organisations, but our product is scaled to be able to deal with small SME-type organisations right through to the large-scale enterprise that you see up here. Now, Really what all this boils down to is that our focus, our conviction into the marketplace is really based on being the market leader and being different through product and technical innovation into the marketplace. And this is why we invest so much money, 17% of our turnover, back into the R&D space to be the market leader in this space. Now that equates to almost 80 people that we employ directly for R&D. And part of that R&D that we do is also through uh, uh, in excess of 30 research uh, uh, universities and laboratories where each of them run projects in, co in collaboration. And from the output of these laboratories, we're taking that research and it's regularly being integrated into our solution to essentially bring about the best performance and value to our customers that can be achieved. So if you've got questions on who we are as an organization or some of the clients that we've got up there or any other questions that you've got, please put these in through the chat log um, and we will then deal with that uh, towards the end of the session. So we're now going to get into digital transformation and what does that really mean from a finance department perspective? So. 
from our pers- from our point of view, more than half of our turnover is represented by specifically supplier invoices, and you know this is key because this is what we're talking about today, and th- this is why we are uh, the experts purely in this area. And what we're going to look at first is some feedback that we've had and feedback from research that we did with CFOs at the beginning of this year. And really what are their priorities with just purely within the financial department rather than out across the, the rest of the, the organization. Now this was done via PwC. So we did this in partnership with them uh, at the beginning of this year. The results are split down into priority one, priority two, and priority three, uh, demonstrating the different colors that are represented up there. And the, the top one uh, up there, which represents 73% of the CFO's priority, split into the, the different areas, is really to reflect the increased need for these departments to provide even more value to the business and the business units than they have been able to achieve. Now this can only be achieved by being able to drive better matching capability with the data and using the digital data as an extension for that performance management capability. So performance management in this case really is talking about how can they do things faster, better, quicker, rather than uh, anything else? The next one that we have up there is in terms of development strategy. Now, development strategy is, in this case, is not looking so much at the CFOs in terms of their major role, <clears throat> excuse me, from a support and advisory perspective, but is in terms of looking at uh, what and how they can apply that into the marketplace so that it's not just about investment decisions. And then we're on to what 51% of them are saying is uh, uh, key for them is round optimization of processes, specifically within purchase to pay, order to cash, this side of things. So really what they're talking about here is how do we make this simpler? How do we standardize our processes? How do we make them more explicit? Um, and these are two of the, the common uh, strategies that are coming out uh, very regularly over the last couple of years that uh, CFOs are trying to achieve. And new technologies are really allowing this to uh, drive through the ability to perform low value added tasks much more efficiently and more importantly, much more effectively. And we'll come on to the, the effectiveness side of things uh, much more. If we look at, uh, at something like cash management, from a CFO's point of view, you know, they are very much looking at uh, cash management in terms of <clears throat> it's really important to the organization. It is looking at being able to you know, understand uh, uh, what cash do they have to be able to pay, et cetera. But what they're really talking about here is they want more information on cash flow analysis to be able to have predictive understanding of what they need going forwards what costs do they have coming up as opposed to what money do they need to pay and it's a bit too late. Another important one is about risk management. Now, from CFO's perspective, probably the, the two key things that they're looking at from a risk perspective is around fraud, fraud and cybercrime. Uh, and this relates back to one of the uh, disruptive technologies we're going to talk about later uh, around blockchain. So. Most organizations are uh, looking at and setting up things like CSPs or acquiring skills other than purely accounting and financial skills to augment and accompany digital transformation. So this is all part and parcel of the bigger picture that is being put in place. Talent management, well, you know, most organizations look at talent management and go, how do we keep staff? And to a certain extent, this plays to what they're looking to be able to do within the finance team as well, because this is about how happy are your staff, how happy are the staff using the systems, using the capability that's in place, and how is that helping to retain staff, for instance, being able to put a more modern, up-to-date environment in place, being able to 
adapt your existing staff and provide them new skills that they wouldn't have had before, being able to put a more enjoyable workplace uh, in place that uh, allows the staff to feel more valued, they're less likely to leave. It's as simple as that. So that's at a high level what the CFOs are looking at. How does that actually relate back to some technology? Well, if we look at uh, some of the technical aspects that are driving digital transformation, we can see at the top some of the levers that have been implemented. And the, the lower graph is showing the focus that organizations have really up to you know, 2020, 2021. And in most cases, let's say 2016, 2017, it was mainly about how do we digitalize purchase to pay, orders cash, uh, you know, uh, R to R, how do we put dashboards, KPIs, analytics, etc., in place? And, you know, not surprisingly, because the uh, data viz side of things has had a huge amount of visibility in the press recently, then it's now getting to a point where we need to capitalize on this digitalization that is being put in place. It may not be put in place across the organization, but it's being put in place. How do we leverage this capability to be able to automate and maximize what's happening within the AP function? And we can see down here on the right hand side of the screen, we've got robotics. We've got blockchain, we've got big data, but big big data plays into dashboard and visualization and analytics. So there's a lot of things in here where there are misnomers about what's being talked about, what's actually being implemented, and the reality of what's being talked about in the media, uh, out in the marketplace, <clears throat> and what some of the vendors are also saying. So why is it then, that when we look at projects for the next three years, digitalization in the purchase to pay order to cash arena is a major project with almost 50% of the CFOs that were uh, asked to take part in this, still such a major area. Now, the C there was about 400, and somewhere between 400 and 450 CFOs who responded to this PwC uh, report. So it was a very broad number of organizations across a number of different verticals of which most of them are still struggling to get their heads around and actually put digitalization in place there's a huge number of people who are struggling to understand what this all means for them uh, as well as how they can gain benefit within their organization but they know they have to do it so from that from that point of view what we're then looking at is what what does this mean and where is the benefit that you're going to get? And this is what we're going to get into shortly about how well these products are and how much we are going to be able to discuss this, you know, what level of maturity they're at that, and how well does the marketplace understand that. So that takes us on nicely to the maturity of technology. Now, this is a well-known graph by Gartner. It's... Um, I believe famously known as the hype cycle. And on the left hand side, uh, visibility, uh, so the upwards part of the graph, <clears throat> is all about the amount of marketing, the amount of media attention, the amount of hype that is seen out in the marketplace. And along the bottom axis is maturity. So this is about how well the product works. You know, how well does it meet expectations? And what we can see down here as the technology trigger, is this is really when a technology comes out at the start. So something comes out down here and get, starts to get a lot of uh, uh, visibility in the marketplace. So a new company or, and it usually tends to be a, a new company comes out with uh, a new product, it may come out from a technology lab, something like that. You know, this is where we then get startups uh, and they're trying to be uh, uh, very media savvy about how do they get attention in the marketplace. Blockchain's a prime example of that, for instance. And these tend to be early adopters at this point, where the organizations that they've sold into have bought into the hype, the early adopters rounds, we want to be able to do something different from the competition, we want to be seen to be leading technology, and 
you know, there's they're, they're cre creating a lot of proof of concepts and capability of what it's likely to do. Then we're moving into, you know, this peak of inflated expectations. So what we're talking about here is at the top of the curve, technology is getting huge amounts of press, huge amounts of attention. Lots of media is talking about uh, the capability, you know, what you could be able to achieve with that. Absolutely fantastic. It means all that's really doing is driving more proof of concepts, more organizations buying into the capability of it. But what's also starting to come out of this, especially when we come to this part here specifically, where my mouse is on the trough, we're now into a little bit of a downward spiral here. This is where, you know, there's there's some negative articles that start coming out that it's maybe not quite achieving what organizations believed it was initially going to be able to do. And this takes us then to the next area. This is where second generation, third generation uh, of technology capability has come out from the initial technology trigger that started this off. This is where there tends to be some market rationalization coming in, uh, where there's a consolidation of suppliers. And there tends to be, you know, more uh, uh, use of the technology and commoditization of the product uh, of the, the, the product. But at this point, the research is showing feedback from Gartner here that the products appear to equip less than five percent of the target marketplace. So we then get into, you know, the the slope of enlightenment. And what we're doing here with the next generation of capability is it's more of a generalized capability that's uh, being shown in the marketplace. There's much more growth that comes out of that, sustained growth that comes through with more packaged and service offerings around this, which are out of the box, rather than so much customization that's gone on before. And this is getting into you know, a good level of maturity uh, at this stage and where we're heading towards the plateau of productivity. Now, at this point, in between slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity, there's a line to be drawn somewhere. But, uh, you know, again, back to Gartner for this. This is around about the stage where 30 percent of the target market is. So we're now talking about specialization here is now being equipped. And it's important to have this cycle in mind when we start looking to distinguish between the maturity of purchase to pay solutions out in the marketplace and disruptive technologies like blockchain. And that's really where we're going to go next is to look at some of these disruptive technologies that are out in the marketplace now. And we're going to look at a, a number of them. First one that we're going to look at is cloud. Now this has been around for a while, um, and the cloud is usually now generally tended to be used as a deployment capability for organisations that want to do something rather than doing an on-premise solution. And there's uh, reasons for that that we'll come to uh, later as well. Now, coming back to the previous slide with the the Gartner uh, hypercycle on the level of maturity. Cloud is very much in that um, pro productivity plateau. So it's on the right hand side of the screen. It's been around for a while. It's tried and tested. It's pretty much well known out there and is used in a lot of different ways. The key thing around this, though, for most organizations is, well, really what you're doing is outsourcing your infrastructure to someone else to look, look after. And that usually for most organizations is because your existing infrastructure tends to be you know, quite heavy, it's slow to react, you know, there, it takes a lot of time to be able to get things done within the organization. But for specialist uh, uh, areas that you're looking at, and we'll come back to the P2P side of things, this could be a, a way where you can get up and running quickly because you're looking at the organization who's providing you the application to provide that uh, cloud infrastructure for you as well. And because it's um, now done as a cloud-based solution, there are other aspects to that. It should give you a huge amount of agility in terms of, if you think about your buying cycle, if you were to buy, look to go to buy uh, something today, how long is it before 
you're likely to actually have it in place up and running with a go live. It's likely, if you're lucky, to be six months, probably longer. Whereas with a cloud-based solution, it's likely to happen within a couple of months, for instance, maybe even earlier. So there's a huge amount of agility that you can have that can jump your competition in terms of what you can bring to market. We then talk about elasticity or flexibility um, out in the marketplace. So this is not just about the ability to scale up uh, uh, you know, a new product that you're looking to bring to market and handle these peaks and troughs, but it's also mainly uh, about reducing the processing capability and the costs associated with processing when you've got a load drop as well. Part of that, we've got low entry for disruptive technology. What does that mean? Well, you know, this one and pay as you go are very closely related to each other. Uh, generally, cloud based tends to be an operational cost. It tends to be more of a pay as you go on a pay monthly type uh, basis contract rather than an upfront uh, capex. And therefore, it means that it's far less or far more, I should say inexpensive to be able to access this. But as part of that, with these new providers coming through with cloud-based capability, cloud-based solutions, it's also relatively inexpensive to access new N-type technologies that in the past would have required large-scale server farms, large computational capabilities, such as big data or AI to be able to achieve the same type of capability. And the last point there around new services, this is where um, cloud is able to bring new data sharing capabilities to, uh, to practice that just hadn't been there in the past. So think of things like WAS, or an even simpler one for you is something like Trainline or TomTom Tom and live services. You may not use TomTom, Tom, there are lots of other ones out there. Um, but with something like Trainline, you can get up-to-date live information uh, to your hands. TomTom Tom Live Services, and you know there, there are other ones out there, um, they are able to uh, pull all the data together from other users on the system to be able to provide that to yourself as well. And this is really important when we start looking at the invoice processing side of things, especially from a capture perspective. Right, let's look at robotics. And we're going to look at robotics and robotic process automation here, specifically. Um, this is also a, a, a subject area or a, a product area that has a, a, a good level of maturity. And going back to the Gartner hypercycle slide again, has reached the towards the middle to right hand side of the productivity plateau uh, curve. So it's been around for a long time. It hasn't necessarily been talked about for a long time, but it's been around for a long time. Now, the, the robotics is really aimed at low value, uh, but it's essential tasks within an organization. Okay. So, you know, this is really aimed at organizations that want to go digital. So a precursor to this is that digitalization is a requirement uh, because you can't apply robotics to a piece of paper. Very difficult for all in the context of what we're trying to you know, achieve here. So we need to be able to go digital. And uh, therefore, this is mainly aimed for organizations that may have a level of um, digitalization in place. And we'll come on to that uh, aspect as well shortly. Um, but it's mainly for organizations that have paper in place or even um, straight EDI in place from that perspective. So we're really talking about how do we remove paper out of an organization? Now, it is true that when you read in the press, you might think that one, one of the technologies drives out the other. But in reality, this is each relevant to... Uh, the needs of the other more than anything else. And what we're finding is there are a number of different ways that this can be done. So you can have a business process management suite, BPMS. There are business rules engines out there. There are integration engines around web, web services for APIs, and there's a, a number of different ways that can be uh, achieved as well. 
and then we come to robotic process automation and RDA. What we're really saying and talking about this is that some of these tools make it possible to digitalize and to roboticize very quickly the processes that are out there that require technical steps and human decisions or human steps. So this is you know, an, an amalgamation of two of them rather than anything else. The rules engines are usually adapted to allow users to modify certain rules without going through uh, coding and uh, you know, technical people for that. And finally, what we're also talking about here is that the headlines at the moment for RPA and RDA allow you to automate tasks with applications that do not allow or do not offer API or web services. So this technology offers the last uh, gap in the uh, technology area to get to 100% automation of the tasks. Now this is, so this is aimed at manual paper-based you know, areas. Some of the usage areas at the bottom are extract, uh, extracting attach, attachments, if I can even say it, from an email. And that's great, but that actually doesn't necessarily mean, and we know uh, back to the maturity curve, that there are organizations out there that can extract the attachment from an email, but then do nothing with it. So then we're back to the maturity of a particular product in a particular sector with that specialization. Because if you're looking at uh, emails, they come in multiple formats, multiple structures, and how do you automate uh, that side of things? So really some technologies that will say they do robotics or robotic process automation are maybe not as mature as other products that are out there. And that's something to bear in mind when you're looking at uh, capabilities for your organizations. The example being, can you extract an attachment from an email and can you process that automatically? Can you do data extraction from that? Can you do data validation from that? Some can't, some can't. Okay, let's look at the next piece. So we've, I've got down artificial intelligence as a separate section from robotics. So robotics is very much about, you know, if this happens, do that. Artificial intelligence is very different from robotics, but actually it's something that should be working alongside robotics rather than being seen as it's the be all and end all or it's the next step. So if we look at something like neural networks and machine learning, and to a certain extent deep learning, and I'll come back to that one uh, slightly later, they are essentially all in one of the same thing. So you will have some organizations that will only talk about neural networks or only talk about machine learning or only talk about deep learning. But the reality is they are all essentially uh, uh, one and the same type of capability. But with the big difference being that they are targeted on very specialized specific tasks. So if you look at uh, under usage, for instance, character recognition, document recognition, separation, et cetera, et cetera. So really what we're talking about here is once you have got a document that's come in, so let's say for instance, it's a, a document which has come in by email and we've processed that um, email. How do you define the uh, something on that document? So that, that could be, how do you define a nine from an eight? How do you define an invoice from a delivery note? How do you define an invoice from um, a credit note? Things like that is what we're really talking about. And there's a big difference here between uh, what machine learning does uh, or neural networking does and robotics, because robotics doesn't do that. Okay, so this is where artificial intelligence is being able to read something and understand that. So how does it differentiate, for instance, a cat from a car? Okay, that we have up on the screen, for instance. So, you know, there are ways and means that that gets done. So, for instance, with traditional machine learning, it was necessary for an engineer or a specialist, technical person, who would describe the characteristics of that specific criteria, i.e. a cat and a car. 
so that um, from that we could then say and understand and recognize the cat and go do this with the cat or do this with the car something different okay whereas with you know the deep learning side of things and the combination of all of this this is where we can then start to essentially roboticize for lack of a better word the engineer so the machine itself is doing that learning that had been input to it through the engineer so if we look at this slide part of the slide here where we've got the car and the input uh, characteristics are dealt with by a human being to put the classification in place to then have the output of its car or it's a cat for instance we now have the machine learning the deep learning the neural networking capability in place that we don't need the engineer to be able to do that as much and this is where the ai side of things really starts to come in so let's put a bit of context around this to make it a bit more real the person who successfully started using this deep learning AI type of capability was actually a Frenchman, but that has nothing to do with our company, in all honesty. Uh, a person called Jan Lee Kloon. And he pulled this together um, using image recognition through a competition called ImageNet. And there was a couple of his colleagues who you know, pulled this together. He's now in charge of artificial intelligence at Facebook. That's how much importance that this is getting and if we look at the bottom part of this this is uh, at the bottom of the slide we've got david searley he's a vice president at gartner and what he's saying here is exploit ai technologies but do it for specialized use so don't do it across the board let's not look at uh exploiting it for uh, you know, how do you make a human being a robot with all the facial expressions walking around, etc. Let's use the AI capability in specific concrete applications rather than anything else. Keep the focus is really what he's uh, talking about there. We're now going to have a look at advanced analytics. <clears throat> now, BI has been around for a long time um, and big data has been around for just as many, uh, in all honesty. But this is something which has been a buzz term uh, right now for quite a while. And really what we're talking about here is things like in-memory processing. Why is uh, in-memory processing, which allows all that data discovery um, side of things to happen, important? Well, you know, for instance, it allows you to multiply by more than a thousand percent the performances that allow you to realize and see data in different ways than you would have been able to see it before. That allows you to uh, have more insight into the data. So for instance, if we go to the usage aspect, identification and anticipation of bottlenecks. Great, okay, we can anticipate now that there are going to be potential problems based on certain criteria. We can now start talking about how do we actually um, look forward to be able to solve some of this some of the predictive uh, capability that uh, you're getting from a reporting <coughs> vehicle and all of this is being driven out by your kpis this is where you're looking to drive value into the uh, organization back to the gartner quote uh, where uh, david searley was talking about exploit the ai capability but keep it very focused on job specific stuff so that you get the value coming out of it okay last one and surprise surprise we're going to talk about blockchain so we're going to finish on on this uh disruptive technology now this has been around for quite a few years now in all honesty but it's made a huge buzz uh back in well last year basically and still continues uh, to do that most of you may have heard about this through things like uh, Bitcoin uh, or the cryptocurrencies that has uh, been going on for a while. And this is a disruptive technology. But I don't know if you were aware, beginning of this year, the capitalization of um, uh, Bitcoin was nearly $200 billion. And that represents, bizarrely enough, one thirty-fifth of the world 
gold stock. That's how much this is changing in the marketplace. That's how much of an impact uh, this is having. So what is blockchain? Well, really, the key thing about this, about blockchain, is tamper-proof traceability. So what does that actually mean? It's forgery-proof. So come back to one of the um, uh, directives that the CFOs had for the priorities in 2018 about risk control. Well, this is where the fraud side of things starts to come in because this is a fraud, forgery, forgery proof, sorry, shared repository that ensures, it guarantees the traceability of documents. That has a huge impact. So for instance, since uh, 2016, the blockchain uh, has already been used for the exchange of cash vouchers and prescriptions have been issued at the end of 2017 for the exchange of certain unlisted securities. Okay, this is mainly on the financial markets, but it's being used in more and more different um, uh, areas because of the um, tamper-proof capability it has. So smart contracts that are coming through uh, to be able to define the attributes and conditions of that uh, transaction. Food traceability. So having a governance trail through the uh, whole food chain is really important. Close to our concerns, this could be an alternative to EAS for the pro prohibitive archiving of electronic documents, uh, such as invoices, for instance. Uh, but the legislation isn't quite there to be able to keep up with demands. But blockchain is coming. It will have an impact at, uh, or a bigger impact at some stage. So, in light of um, all these different types of disruptive technologies that are out there, that and there will be more that will come through as well, and what we're finding is that these disruptive technologies are coming through faster, and having more of an impact, and they're growing in quantity. What we're now going to look at is uh, the digitalization of supplier invoices, because that has a big, strong impact into fin finance departments. First thing is, why are organizations looking to do this? OK, first one is about reducing processing costs. Really, the key thing about this is for most organizations, AP and finance is seen as a cost center. It's, you know, there are lots of other things, but it's a cost center. It's a back office function. It costs money. Therefore, how do we change AP from being a cost center to at least at minimum a lower cost center? How do we reduce that cost? There are other aspects to it as well. Um, but I'll give you an example. Uh, some of the research that we've had done for, mo for a lot of organizations, when an invoice is received in paper, it's on average duplicated five times to allow different services to process. Um, and that generates a significant cost within the organization, never minding things like envelope stamps, ink, photocopiers, blah, blah, blah. Um, so an average cost of an invoice in most organizations is somewhere between, when they're manually based, somewhere between 14 to 16 pounds. Once you automate, it drops by almost two thirds. It's something like seven pounds, if not less, depending on how, much, how far you go in the digitalization range rather than anything else. So let's translate that into something meaningful. If you process 30,000 invoices a year and you now digitalize that by putting automation in place, depending on what you put in place, obviously, the company could save more than £200,000 once that's digitalized. Now, that cost could be further reduced through you know, other uh, manual tasks, such as the input aspect or the reconciliation uh, or invoice routing, etc. But uh, that's, you know, that, that we can go into more detail. Any questions on that, please put them in through the chat log. That would be great. Now, there are several studies out there that show that less than half of the paper invoices are settled at maturity. Wow, that means the processes are too long, there's huge circulation of paper copies, and it means that uh, the
time that's taking to resolve invoices is somewhere between 10 to 15 days. Now, digitalize your process, that's going to be you know less than three for uh, some suppliers. And we've got one of our customers which takes 1.2 days from receipt of invoice to the point where they're ready to pay. Now, other aspects around mastering your process times, for instance, um, who has duty to report as um, a consideration? All of a sudden, it's now no longer about mastering your process times and your payment deadlines. It's actually about how do you report on that and what is the reputation within the organization? We also then have uh, how do you take out errors? How do you uh, de-risk? How do you deal with the potential fraudulent side of things? How do you get the insights? How do you get visibility into the organization? If you don't have it digital, you can't see where it is. I'm sorry, folks, it's just as simple as that. You can't have visibility of a paper invoice unless you're creating more work by manually recording it somewhere. It's just not gonna happen. <clears throat> if you extrapolate that out, that the impact of that means that how are you able to um, manage budgets, for instance? How is procurement able to understand the purchase spend on a per vendor basis and be able to negotiate better contracts? Huge number of things that are going on there that uh, you're not able to do. So this is the whole point of what we're trying to put in place. So what does it you need to be able to do? Well, so we're looking at uh, some of the functional requirements that you should be looking at you know, if you're looking to go down this route. If you already have some capability in place, well, I would suggest you need to look even further. The key one being, <clears throat> at the very start of the process, and we'll look at the process in a, in a minute, manage all invoice formats. So you're going to get them coming in by paper because you already have that. You're going to have them coming in by email. I know you already have that. You may be having them come in by EDI. Um, or e-invoicing. But actually, from our point of view, you need to be able to deal with all of these because how many of you are able to um, uh, tell your suppliers that you can only uh, manage invoices a certain way? Okay, so you firstly need to be able to just deal with all of them. The next thing you're looking at is how do you take out manual tasks within that, specifically within the AP function. So we're talking about manual data entry of an invoice into your ERP. How do you apply the uh, control and framework that you have in your ERP to your invoices? How do you get your matching done? Especially POs, uh, you may have line items that you need to be able to match. How do you get good receipts put in the system? How do you notify the business that they need to deal with things? How do you route your invoices out into the business where where there are discrepancies? Now, you'll get discrepancies on PO invoices. You'll get discrepancies on your EDI invoices. Um, the best that we find is usually about a 75% um, EDI rate. It, it will vary. That's an average. Okay. How do you get that dealt with through the same governance control framework? How do you get that out into the business rather than sitting with AP? How can you prove to the business that you're doing a good job within the organization. And part of that's about how can you uh, demonstrate to the business what's happening, where it is, what's going on. So these are the areas that we're asking you to look at within your own organization. And if you're looking at being able to put digital automation in place to speak with your vendors about how do they do it simply, fast and easily for the requirements that you have. Okay. Let's have a look at <clears throat> what is the process. So this is about a generic, so it's high level, AP process that we're looking at here. And the first thing you need to be able to do is capture any invoice that comes in, whether it's from a paper, whether it comes in by email as an attachment, whether it's imported in through you know, a portal or it comes in through uh, um, various uh, other types of portals, uh, whether it's an e-invoice and that's for most organizations, let's just make this simple, e-invoice is EDI. Or whether it comes in through, it could be an iPhone, it could be an Android phone, it's essentially a picture. You've got to be able to take all of that. And that's the capture piece. Great. So you've captured um, that document. 
The next key thing you need to be able to do with that is how do you extract the data out of that? So if you think of capture as robotics, extraction validation as AI, okay? How do you get that extracted, validated, so that you can achieve a no-touch straight through to your ERP system? Now, we've just put export to your ERP system there, and that's because from our perspective, IT soft view, we don't care what your ERP is. We've dealt with SAP, Oracle, JD Edwards, Agresso, Integra, Sun, you name it. Uh, we've done it right down to Sage 50 for organizations. So getting data in and out of these systems, we can deal with. Don't worry about that. This is about how do you digitalize. And more importantly, how do you get this level here, no touch, straight through processing with all your PO-based invoices and uh, any that aren't PO-based are now going to have to come to someone in the AP team because we're not going to know where to send them. But think of your PO rate. If you've got a 50% PO rate, that's 50% of your uh, invoices that have gone straight through the system. You're not dealing with. Now, they might be out in the business dealing with discrepancies, but AP are not working on them. AP are working on this piece here. A non-PO invoice has come to them where they need to either uh, send it out into the business for coding and approval, or we generally find AP normally code and then workflow out into the business who are going to deal with the approval side of things. Once that has been uh, uh, confirmed and validated, and you may have a number of steps of validation to go through for the approval matrix, that then gets exported back out to your ERP system. Now, there is one other way where uh, invoices can be uploaded into the system, and that's through the supplier portal. That's also important as part of the AP process because how many times do AP get the phone call? Have you got my invoice? When's it going to be paid? And how do you deal with supplier statements? What do you, what do, you do when you get the phone call from the supplier or the email going, can you just tell me and give me a breakdown of the payment you made last month for £100,000? What invoices does it cover? That's essentially what supplier portal's for. It's a self-service capability for organizations to go and get that, that information without bothering AP. And of course, one of the key things that we've been talking about here is visibility and governance. We have that with the analytics. From the point that an invoice comes in to the point that it's been paid, you can see where it is in the organization. Okay. Some of the problems that are out there with the existing systems. So these are essentially on-premise solutions, and we've talked a little bit about this before, but cost of it. Really, the key thing is actually about the extraction rates. Most of them are getting somewhere between 35 to 50% if they're lucky. This is mainly because of things like uh, supplier data being not great and the level of input it needs to be able to uh, keep it at a level. If you can increase that, from down here, we can see we've got 50% to 85%. The real impact that has for an organization is you can process three times the number of invoices uh, based, based on full-time people in the team rather than how it previously has been done. Another option, let's outsource it. You know what? It's just too difficult. Let's just give the whole problem to someone else and they'll deal with the whole thing. But couple of things with this, really. Your problems in terms of invoices, well, they'll, they'll get the invoices into your system, but they can't tell you whether it's right or not. So you're still going to have to deal with errors, which doesn't take away the issue. More importantly, it's just slowed down the whole process because you've added a huge step into it uh, by putting it out through another organization. We'll come back to that. I'm not going to touch on this too much because I'm aware of time. And we'll move on. Another alternative is cloud. We've talked about cloud, and people have come out with standard cloud-based solutions. And the problem with that, specifically related to the P2P capability, is they tend to be very limited. Think of Facebook. You've all got Facebook. Does Facebook fit everyone from an invoice processing point of view? Well, no, it doesn't, because it has no way of being able to customize. It doesn't have any ability to uh, change workflows, for instance. It doesn't leverage any of the investment that you've made in your uh, ERP to do with some of the controls that are in there, for instance. 
and it still doesn't deal with the data extraction aspects, which we'll come on to in a minute. Right, what we're going to look at now is Streamline. This is the next generation of software that has been brought out specifically for accounts payable. So what we have here is bottom left hand side of the screen where most organizations are. <coughs> they are completely manual. And what they're trying to do is get their extraction and validation rates up so they've got, they're dealing with more invoices per full time equivalent. And then what we have along here on the bottom end of the screen is how easy is it for that to do it. So we talked about um, standard cloud based uh, organizations and where they are. Well, they move forward because they've got a level of digitalization in place. The next step is, well, go on prem. And yes, that's given better results, but it's still not great. 35 to 50 percent is what we talked about or outsource it. Well, yeah, in all honesty, BPOs are no better to your team doing it internally. At this moment in time, it's just you've put the cost somewhere else. So with Streamline for Invoices, we have a module called CAS, which is Capture as a Service, which by far and away outstrips what is out there on the marketplace by a long shot. And let's talk about that a little bit more. So this is a completely different change to what is currently out there in the marketplace as a disruptive service because no one else is doing this. This is uniquely uh, operated by ITsoft. We have produced this product to market uh, and basically it's really looking to deal with the uh, uh, extraction and validation aspects rather than anything else. <clears throat> because we manage it, we deal with it as a black box. You can see down in the bottom right hand side of the screen that uh, there are some yellow, uh, green even, wrong colour, screens down here. Now we've taken this as a snapshot from one of our clients. They're getting 92, almost 92% extraction rates based on this. And part of that's because we're working on the basis of a, a mutualized supplier database. So we have a supplier database to help recognize uh, and deal with the issue that your data may not be as clean and tidy as ours. Highly innovative and highly disruptive approach to the marketplace. So this means you don't need staff to be able to monitor it and keep it going. So the next part after we've done capture and we've done that um, uh, AI extraction validation pieces, what do we do with it? What do we do with the data and the documents? How do we move it around? So as part of Streamline, we've developed an agile, <coughs> excuse me, workflow capability, which is based on business process management capability. Low code, which means you guys don't have to worry about it. The key thing about this is that it allows parallel and sequential processing. Why is that important? Because you can choose how, whatever you want to be able to and however you want to be able to send this out in your team. But it more importantly gives you easy configuration to meet the specifics and uniquenesses of your company that allows your company to be different from your competition and it gives that customization in a cloud solution. Highest possible level of customization without having to uh, get into code. We're going to move on to integration and how do we integrate and why is integration important because we have to do it. I put the three biggest uh, uh, ERP vendors up there uh, on the right hand side of the screen, Oracle, SAP and Dynamics. There are many others and we integrate with um, pretty much all of them. Most cloud solutions offer a very simple um, text file interchange with your ERP. And that tends to be a, a very much an asynchronous type integration that's put in place, but it doesn't actually use any of the controls and governance that you have in place in your ERP. So that then creates errors when you're trying to write to your ERP, which means you've got to you know, sort out these errors and therefore you're not getting very much automation in place. So what we're doing here that is a difference is the use of synchronous connector. <clears throat> and this completely eliminates the invoices that would be an error because we're using the controls that you have in your ERP. And that means you can then get the highest level of automation or straight through processing that you're looking to try and achieve in your organization. 
As part of that, all organisations are looking at how can we get more visibility. So what we're looking to be able to do here, with analytics, you're getting a lot more data, huge amounts more data, which you're having access to. And it's how do you use that to create the dashboard that's relevant for your business, back to the Gartner quote about keeping it specialised, that will drive value for your organisation. So unlike traditional query-based BI tools, because you know there's a level of uh, similarity to this, all the data is available to be able to drill down and drill down and take you to where you need to go based on your intuition rather than predefined queries. I'm aware of time. I'm aware we're almost over running in all honesty. So if you've got questions, please drop them in through the chat log and we'll deal with this after the webinar. Uh, but usually we have quite a few uh, queries on the analytics aspects to this. Final one is supplier portal. Um, a couple of years ago, I was getting a huge amount of um, uh, media attention. It's still out there as disruptive uh, technology because it's, it is doing things different from how most organizations are talking about dealing with suppliers. So supplier statements, for instance. How do you automate supplier statements? Well, let's look at this a different way. Let's put the capability in place for your suppliers to be able to do all the things that they would normally call you about or send you questions about and let them do that themselves. It's a different way of being able to deal with this. It's very disruptive, but it's very, for the organizations that have got these, it's very valuable for them. So just quickly to summarize uh, what we've been through there, new generation, new technology capability, very disruptive in the marketplace. It basically addresses all the problems with on-premise or outsourcing or standard uh, SaaS-based uh, solutions that are out there in the marketplace and uh, allows you a huge level of automation within the organization with uh, recognition rates uh, in excess of 85%. Right, questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for bearing with me so far. Um, please put your questions in now. I am aware we have actually overrun, but please put your questions in now. Yes, um, we have run over time at the moment, Alan. So, um, yep. but I have, um, we do have a note of those questions, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to answer Fantastic. them um, at the end of the vlog. Um, so, I do appreciate your presentation, and thank you so much um, for everyone uh, attending. Um, we will be sending um, everyone a copy of the recording um, and the presentation um, by the end of the day. Um, and also, uh, there will be a feedback link as well. We would appreciate if you could give us some feedback in regards to our events and how we can approve it. Um, so you will get that along with the presentation and the recording. Um, but thank you very much, Alan. Um, and I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you. And everyone have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.